Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about word sense evolution, that is, semantic change. And for this, we're joined by Ray Belli. Ray is the host of Words for Granted, a podcast that looks at how words change over time. So we thought he'd be the perfect person to ask on to talk about the subject of this episode. Hi, Ray. Hi, Ray. Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks for coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but just before we get started, I wanted to thank our newest Patreon supporters, including Zach Kanzler. Thank you very much to everyone who's newly come on board and to everyone who continues to support us through Patreon. Now, the reason we're talking about this topic today for this episode is that Mark has just released a video titled Why Do Word Meanings Evolve? as part of a larger group of educational YouTubers who have put out videos on why things evolve from selfies to the two sexes to algorithms to land animals going back to the sea. So the topic has been on our minds. By the way, if you want to see our video or the other fantastic videos by our fellow EduTubers, there's a link in the show notes, or you can go to youtube.com slash alliterative to see the video and to find the playlist. So that's why we're talking about this today. But of course, it's something that as someone who works on etymology, Mark, you always are addressing. Yes. And Ray, this is the entire purpose of your podcast. <laughs> that's exactly right. It's basically an entire podcast dedicated to the topic of this one episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of the various examples of it and what they tell us about the peculiarities of language and also about people, which I think is really a fascinating way to take it. Definitely. So what is your background? Why did you get into this topic? What sparked your interest? Okay, it is um, a pretty unusual story. <laughs> and I swear that it's true. <laughs> So I guess I'll preface that by saying uh, my background is actually m mostly in fiction. Uh, you know, I, I studied English and at one point wanted to be a fiction writer mm -hmm. and then got distracted by the career of a professional musician. But as far as the linguistics and the etymology stuff goes, it goes back to one fateful day when I was 18 or 19 years old. And I was over a friend's house and in his bathroom, there was an art history book. And so I was just skimming through it and I, I found this, this Renaissance painting and I don't remember the name of the painting. I don't remember the visual details, uh, but in the title was the word Pasio. Mm -hmm. And there was a, it depicted the crucifixion of Christ and there was a footnote and it said that Pasio was the Latin word for, for suffering and that it gave us the modern English word passion. Right. And this blew my mind uh it was like a, a totally life-changing like <laughs> random moment in my life and it just got me thinking about wow okay so words change and this is kind of where the the name of my podcast came from because until that point as cliche and corny as it sounds i had taken for granted that words come from somewhere right and you know e even though we use language every day and we witness words changing around us all the time it's it's just something we don't think about because the language is kind of automatic you know we don't think about grammar when we speak we don't think about mm -hmm. the cultural context that we're in in this moment we just speak the words happen we know what they mean or we think we know what they mean and we hope that we're communicating something so it kind of became an like un unofficial job of mine <laughs> from that point forward to just keep my eye out for like interesting etymological bits and little nuggets that I could find. I, I didn't pursue it in an active sort of way, but I kept my eye out for it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Right. And I just always dreamed of like, oh, maybe one day I'll compile this amazing collection of like the greatest hits of <laughs> semantic change. Mind you, at, at this point, when I, when I was kind of getting on this role, I had no formal training in linguistics or historical linguistics mm -hmm. or re re really anything. It was a very accidental self-taught thing that I got into. And Amateur even? To, to call back to one of your episodes? <laughs> th that That's right. A amateur just driven by the sheer uh, love, love of, of, the of the topic mm -hmm. yeah and yeah s since then I, I discovered podcasting and all like the great education podcasts that are out there mm -hmm. and i was like man maybe i can maybe this is the perfect medium for me to like bring this idea to the world and 
I then started for for maybe like almost a year and a half actually I started reading tons of linguistic books and uh, really actively compiling a list of all these things and kind of stringing them together and that yeah that's how the podcast was born so what what are your favorite sources what what are the the textbooks that you kind of turn to um and that you keep going back to for for your information for research uh well of course there's there's the OED that's the the gold mine but you know what people actually ask me this all the time like oh where do you figure out what words to research and honestly it's as simple as once you, once you start digging down the etymological rabbit hole, you, <laughs> you, start, you start seeing the connections. So if something just sparks in my mind, like, oh, I wonder if that word is related to this, I'll just do like a quick search of it and see what I find. And if it looks like it will lead me to somewhere interesting, I'll pursue it further. Um, I, I don't really have like a set, a set of resources that I go to for everything. It really varies from word to word, right. depending on what angle I want to take. Yeah, that's a lot like how it works for you mark yeah it's yeah i just sort of happen across an interesting little tidbit about a word and then sort of explore from there mm -hmm. and you keep a running list of things that are interesting but you don't know where they're going yeah until you find something else that connects with it yeah that sounds exactly like my process as well mm -hmm. a lot of dinner table conversations end up as <laughs> videos yeah <laughs> for instance <laughs> around here Sure. Five seconds into a conversation, Mark's checking to see where. <laughs> Open up in the OED, quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm totally the same way, except with with me. Most of my conversations are just with me myself in my head. <laughs> my roommates give me uh, one word fact a day. <laughs> That's all I get. Well, I guess that kind of answers one of the questions I was going to ask a little bit of, which is why why podcasting specifically. I mean, why do you, do you think there's something about this medium that's useful or is it just because it's an, an accessible one? For one, it, it allows me to serialize the right. topic, right. which is totally awesome, like uh, because it can theoretically go on forever. Like if, mm -hmm. if I were to write a book, say, there are several disadvantages to that. Uh, number one, most people don't read books anymore, sadly. Secondly, for me to get a publishing deal as you know just mm -hmm. an amateur uh, no one would take me seriously and i think maybe most importantly of all this can potentially be a dry topic for some people if, if you're not like tuned in mm -hmm. so for me i try to tell each word story as well just that as a story where the the word itself is kind of the protagonist and it mm -hmm. sets out on its journey <laughs> and it goes wherever the course of the story takes it. And podcasting, you know, since it's not just a dry written medium, mm -hmm. allows me to uh, bring some kind of life to it. And ho hopefully that's what I'm doing and trying to do, at least. So your previous interest in fiction then comes in, in handy in crafting the, you know, the way the, that you tell the story. Definitely. Because I, I do think of... I do think of the episodes as short stories and <laughs> I agonize over like, oh, well, how am I going to get from here to here? Like this plot point to that plot point. <laughs> right. Like I'm, de I'm mm -hmm. definitely thinking of it in kind of in theatrical terms or, or some, something to that effect. Like the Aristotelian uh, rising action, falling action, <laughs> denouement. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, the question that we usually ask guests... Yeah, when we have guests, we, we, we always like to ask this one same question for all of them about the, uh, you know, the place of unexpected connections in their lives and their work. So <laughs> I guess what you've just you, you, told us kind of answers that question. Yeah. <laughs> when we say unexpected connections, often we mean like two fields that they study that they wouldn't have thought connected or something in their private life that influences what they do in their career or, you know, those kinds of things. And it kind of sounds like you've already got two of those. One, the art history book in your friend's right. <laughs> bathroom. <laughs> yeah, just sitting there on the back of the toilet seat, you know. <laughs> and the other, uh, the connection between your fiction writing and etymology. Yeah, I, I mean, it was really a, a collision of interests that kind of randomly came together and then really turned into a, a, a true health the obsession at least i think it's healthy you know <laughs> a passion in the newer sense yes exactly exactly <laughs> no suffering here no no <laughs> except for one's art yes. <laughs> <laughs> for me of course the connection to that came through studying latin and seeing the word patior to suffer i like the connection of that as well to patience yes that like yeah. that one has patience and that the long suffering <laughs> is indeed the same as 
patience. And it also helps with the suffer the children to come unto me phrase. Right. Which makes so little sense in the Bible. Yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, depending on what translation of the Bible Mm -hmm. you're reading, like obviously the King James Bible is like the etymological Mm -hmm. treasure trove uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, But a lot of that stuff just doesn't make sense or seems illogical or wrong Mm -hmm. if you don't know the, if you don't know the context, if you don't know that yeah, l- language changes and language is relative to the culture that's producing it. And mm-hmm. yeah, the Bible's super interesting. And things get frozen into phrases that we accept, as you say, that we take for granted. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it takes a moment of somebody asking about it or noticing a connection for you to go, wait a minute, I, I say that every day, but I don't know what it means or I don't know why I say it. Or And I think that explains why there is quite an interest in etymology Mm -hmm. of sort of popular, you know, that's the sort of thing, you know, when when you mention, oh, well, I work on language or whatever, that's the question you often get is, oh, do you know where this word comes from? Mm -hmm. Or someone will trot out their favorite etymology. Yeah, their favorite etymology. Their favorite surprising fact. Yeah, there's something very fascinating about it for people who aren't otherwise particularly interested in language. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I may be making an overstatement here, but I think (laughs) everyone is interested in etymology. They just don't know it. How can you not be like this is language is something you use literally every day. Even if you speak to no one, you're communicating to yourself in a language just to know like where that inheritance of ideas Mm -hmm. uh, or the ideas contained inside words comes from. Like there's undeniable value to that. And there's something very personal about language, right? It's something that we have a very intimate connection to Mm -hmm. because it is inside our head and we feel a stake in it. We feel an ownership of words and we want to, we're interested in them for that reason. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I mean, people think they know, like, I know what that word means or this word means this to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Everyone Mm -hmm. has their own ownership. I like that term in reference to words. When we talk about language, I think it in part activates the sense that we have when we talk about ourselves. We like talking about ourselves. Everyone likes talking about themselves in some form or another. We like talking about language because we're talking about ourselves. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. The language that we use, and I mean, this is we can go down this rabbit hole. Maybe we shouldn't. (laughs) But both the words that we use to express ourselves and identify the concepts around us and the actual language, you know, whether we're speaking Mm -hmm. English versus Mm -hmm. Arabic versus, you know, whatever. Each of those languages has its own set of expressions, literally Mm -hmm. and, and figuratively. And then what you do and what Mark does, both of you, is also make that connection to, you know, language changes, but it doesn't change in a vacuum. It changes because people move around or things happen or Mm. countries go to war or whatever. I mean, language bears on it the marks of history. So when we examine it, we examine it's like looking at the corpse for the, that's a grim metaphor let's try another one (laughs) (laughs) it's like looking at well now and i'm going for scene of the crime um (laughs) i need a better metaphor anyway we look at the the language to see the marks that history has left on it and that gives us well you use the fossil record fossil record yeah as your metaphor don't you mark yeah that's perhaps less grim than the (laughs) corpse or battlefield still it still involves death in a, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at a nice remove. Yeah, exactly. Death long ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what makes language change interesting is, is the the cultural and historical aspects of it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think a misconception that some people have about etymology is that, okay, here's this modern word and it comes from this word and that's the end of the story. Like, And now you've done the work. Yeah. Yeah. You figured that out. That's all that matters. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's so much more you know being an etymologist is being part historian part cultural analyst you know part psychologist part psychologist sure sure Mm -hmm. things about the sociological elements of change why words become higher or lower status how you know those sorts of things and how that affects how Mm -hmm. people use them that's part of uh, sociology i suppose maybe not psychology but they're connected Mm -hmm. yeah definitely connected Okay, maybe that's a good segue, actually, to listening to the voiceover from the evolution video that Mark's just put out, because it talks about the sort of formal elements of the mechanisms for semantic change. So let's take a moment and listen to that, and then we'll come back and talk some more about that and pick up on some of the topics in it. Why do words evolve? It's well known that language changes over time. But why and how do the meanings of words change? Is there any pattern or system? 
Basically, meanings adapt to suit the needs of the users of a language, with some disappearing when they are not useful, and others spreading quickly because they fit into new environments. The question of why is particularly complicated, but generally there can be said to be a variety of psychological and sociocultural reasons for this kind of change, such as the need for taboo replacement and euphemism, like how to pass away gain the figurative sense of to die instead of referring to any literal movement. As well, real world changes can trigger semantic change. So for instance, technological change, which can render an old word obsolete, or can require the existence of a new word for a new technology while sometimes old words are repurposed for new concepts. Think for instance of the word dial, which comes ultimately from Latin dies meaning day, and therefore originally referred to a sundial or other similar clock face. When other physically similar devices came along, like compasses, they too could refer to dials, and later still, when rotary knobs and controls such as on a rotary phone came along, they too became dials. Now when we push buttons or touch numbers on a smartphone, we still call it dialing, even though there's nothing rotary about it, and certainly nothing to do with the length of a day. Similarly, in the days of movable type printing, the word font referred to a complete set of letters in the same typeface, so called because they were all cast together out of metal. Think foundry. Now with computer word processing, font refers to the typeface itself. Sometimes changes can seem random, but there are some systematic patterns we can see in how words change their meaning. The first axis of change we can see is narrowing versus widening. Examples of narrowing, also called specialization, include meat, which in Old English was a general word for food before it since narrowed to specifically the flesh of animals. Deer, which originally meant any wild animal before becoming restricted to the specific species we mean today. Starve, which in Old English meant to die, but now means more narrowly to die by lack of food. And girl, which could originally refer to a child of any gender. The opposite process, widening or generalization, broadens or extends the sense of a word, as in bird, which as Old English brid meant specifically young bird, with the word fugel, fowl in modern English, being the more general word for bird. And whereas bird widened its meaning to refer to any bird, fowl narrowed its meaning to refer specifically to barnyard birds such as chickens, ducks, and geese. A similar example is holiday, which originally meant a holy day, before its meaning extended to any time off. And a special case of widening is genericization, in which a trademark name becomes a general term for the category, such as Kleenex in some dialects, or as I covered in a previous video, linoleum. The next axis of change is pejoration and amelioration, whether a word becomes more negative or more positive in sense. So, for instance, cunning originally meant learned, coming from the Old English verb kunan, meaning to know. The negative sense of skillfully deceitful doesn't crop up until much later. An interesting case are the words silly and nice. Silly originally meant blessed or happy, coming from an old Germanic root meaning luck or happiness, but the sense went through a series of changes from blessed to pious to innocent or harmless to pitiable to feeble to feeble in mind or, as we think of it today, foolish. Nice, on the other hand, coming ultimately from Latin nescire, to not know or be ignorant, went therefore from meaning ignorant, through such senses as foolish, shy, fastidious, dainty or delicate, refined, and ultimately pleasant, agreeable, or kind, thus going from a distinctly negative sense to a distinctly positive one. So be careful who you call nice or silly. Similar to this type of semantic shift is the degeneration or elevation axis. The Old English words kaffe and knicht both meant boy but the former was demoted to become knave and the latter was elevated to become knight. Weakening and strengthening of semantic meaning is another axis found, though weakening is by far the more common. Something that's awesome, fantastic, and fabulous isn't usually characterized by literal awe, fantasy, or fable, and something that's terrible or horrible doesn't usually invoke actual terror or horror. You can sort of think of them as hyperbole or exaggeration that becomes banal, one example of the opposite might be kill, which seems to have originally meant to strike or hit, but later was strengthened to mean put to death. Two other semantic shifts worth mentioning are figurative ones, metaphor and metonymy. In metaphor, something, usually concrete, gains a more abstract, figurative meaning. Thus, the older sense of field is an open grassy area, but the word gained a metaphorical meaning when used in the sense of, say, the field of linguistics and the base sense of grasp is to physically hold something with your hand, but you can now also grasp the concept of semantic shift. 
And while broadcast originally meant to scatter seeds, now we can say that this lesson on semantic shift is being broadcast on YouTube. Metonymy, on the other hand, is a semantic shift that happens when two things are closely associated with each other. So for instance, bead originally meant prayer, coming from a root that also gives us the word bid. But because of the practice of the rosary or prayer beads, the sense transferred over from the prayers themselves to the little decorative balls on a string or chain that were used to count the prayers. An interesting case of metonymy can be seen with the words cheek and jaw. Cheek in Old English meant jaw or jawbone, and is probably related to the verb chew, but by metonymy it shifted its meaning to the closely associated fleshy part above the jaw. The word jaw, on the other hand, probably comes from the French word joue, meaning cheek, so originally jaw meant cheek and cheek meant jaw. So that's how the meanings of words evolve, and funnily enough, the word evolution itself is a good example of this. You see, Charles Darwin didn't coin the word. It's been around since Classical Latin, and has had many different meanings in English over the years. Darwin wasn't even the first to use it to refer to the process of biological change through natural selection, which he famously expounded on in his Origin of Species. As it turns out, Darwin preferred the term descent with modification, and used the word evolution only once in his writings. It was Darwin's pal, geologist Charles Lyell, who was the first to apply the word evolution to this concept. And, as I said, the word had already been around for a while, making this an example of repurposing an older word for a new idea. In fact, this wasn't even the first biological use of the word. It had previously been used to refer to the idea of the development to maturity of an individual organism over its life cycle, and before that to all manner of developing processes, including, in the 17th century, to the semantic development of a word. This arose from the metaphorical extension of the Latin word evolutio, which meant unrolling, initially with the literal sense of the unrolling of a scroll, but more commonly with the metaphorical sense of reading through a book, which at the time would have been written as a scroll. Aside from clay tablets, scrolls were one of the first types of book technology for extended writing, not just brief inscriptions. Not that they would have called them scrolls at that time. For instance, the Latin for scroll is volumen, which comes from the Latin verb volvera, meaning to turn around a roll, which makes sense when you think about a scroll. Through the process of broadening, the term volume now refers to any type of book, not just scrolls. The word scroll is not so straightforward. Though it sounds like roll, it's actually not etymologically related, though its modern form with the L sound on the end probably does come from roll. Scroll comes from French escroc, from which we also get the legal term escrow, because it was a legal document originally written on a scroll. The French word, which comes from a root that means to cut, and also gives us shred and shear, originally meant a cut piece or strip, and then through that process of narrowing I mentioned, a strip of parchment, and finally a rolled up strip of parchment. The next big advance in book technology is what was called in Latin the codex, what we would think of as a book with pages bound together. The word codex, plural codices, comes from caudex, meaning tree trunk, by the process of metonymy, because the codex technology evolved from wooden writing tablets which had wax covering them that you'd scratch the writing into. Several such tablets could be hinged together, thus leading to the form of the codex or book. The Germanic-derived word book has a similar tree origin, as it's related to the word beech, as in beech tree, so Germanic books were also originally wooden tablets. The ancient Greek word for book, by the way, was biblion, from which we get the words bibliography and the Bible, literally the books. Of course, the word biblion originally referred to scrolls, not the codex, as that came about later in Roman times. Biblion is a toponym, that is, a word that comes from a place name, in this case the ancient Phoenician city of Byblos, which exported papyrus. Which raises the point that ancient scrolls and early codices weren't made from paper. Papyrus is made from layering strips of the pith of the stem of the papyrus plant, a kind of sedge or reed. Our modern word paper comes from papyrus, even though it's made from pulp from plants like linen and hemp, and later wood pulp. Paper technology was invented in China and was only imported into medieval Europe in the 11th century. But there was another writing material commonly used in medieval Europe, the skin of animals such as sheep or calves, known as parchment or vellum. The word parchment is also a toponym from the ancient city of Pergamon, where the technology was developed as an alternative to papyrus. The word vellum, on the other hand, is related to veal, the meat of a calf or young cow, from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning year thus the idea of a year-old calf. Getting back to the Romans, they had another word for book in the general sense of a volume or scroll, 
Latin liber, from which we get the word library. Latin liber could also mean bark, and comes from a Proto-Indo-European root which means to peel or break off, which also gives us, through the Germanic branch, the word leaf. Speaking of leaves, we still sometimes use the word leaves to refer to pages in a book. And there's another leafy word, folio, which has a place in this story of the history of book technology. A folio, from Latin folium, meaning literally leaf, but often meaning page, is what you get if you take the skin of one sheep and trim off all the curvy bits to make a codex. If you fold it in half and bind it together with others, you get what's called a folio-sized book, very large, a size that today we might associate with a large atlas. If you fold that sheepskin in half twice, you get a smaller book with four pages per sheepskin, which is called a quarto, what we would now think of as a large dictionary-sized book. Fold again and you'd produce an octavo, which is the size of a modern hardcover book. Fold again and you get an even smaller book, the size of a modern paperback. One more fold and you get something the size of a small notepad or smartphone. And these comparisons are no coincidence. When books started to be made out of paper rather than parchment, they tended to keep the same sizes as had been created by the properties of the sheepskin, because that's what everyone was used to. And even today, ebooks are designed to be about the same size as the books were used to. So essentially, your Kindle is the size of a sheep. Only now it's come full circle, with e-readers that we can scroll through. Another old word repurposed for new technology, in the ever-evolving history of the book, and language itself adapting to new circumstances. So that's the story of the word evolution and how it's connected to language change, semantic change, different types of semantic shift, and the history of the book. Just a few things. <laughs> so where do we want to go from there? I think, Ray, you had said um, you wanted to talk a little bit about technological change and you have already done a few episodes, a little mini series episodes That's right. on some of the ways that technological change affects language change or some case studies, as it were. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, we, I think we can use that as a springboard and tie it into the evolution of the book. I think we can preface our discussion about technology impacting language change by saying that as new technology emerges, it's not like new words just appear like poof out of thin yeah. air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually we take pre-existing concepts and apply them to what is similar in this new technology, like things that we can relate to. Mm -hmm. a, a great example is the word computer. You know, when the computer was invented, it wasn't like the word computer just appeared. Of course, mm -hmm. it comes from the verb uh, to compute. And the word computer actually has been around for many centuries. I'm not sure if it's the 15th or 16th century, but it, it was recorded in English with the meaning of uh, someone who's good at solving math problems. Yeah. That was a computer. So just repurposed mm -hmm. to this new technology. So book, I think, is particularly interesting because we don't think of a book as a piece of technology, but if technology is just something that's been invented, then of course, at one point the book was invented and was therefore, or was thus new technology. And again, if the etymology that c connects book to the beech tree is mm -hmm. correct, then this proves kind of what I just said, that the beech tree was a pre-existing word or like a right. piece of like stock vocabulary that was yeah. then applied to this new technology, if you will. And what is specifically happening with that is pretty interesting it's taking the the medium that was was used for writing the beech tree was used for runic inscriptions so the beech tree mm -hmm. was a medium for writing so when the technology of the book came around they just applied the word for one medium to, to another uh, to yeah. another yeah. even though the two mediums had no physical resemblance they were just conceptual really and Mm -hmm. I, I think what's really interesting, well, okay, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I mean, today, <laughs> a, a book actually is not defined by text or writing, because like, if you have a blank notebook without text in it, no one's going to say that that's not a book. book that's true. Same thing with like a, a picture book or a photograph book. The thing that makes a book a book conceptually is two covers and pages. I think that's the yeah. that's our I idea of a book. So the actual necessity of writing has been Yeah, that's true. removed. You can have a sketchbook or Exactly. And I I mean maybe you can attribute that to a technological 
developments. But now back to what I was originally saying, what's really interesting <laughs> is that with uh, the invention of ebooks and audiobooks, mm-hmm. the necessity of the physical medium is totally thrown out the window. Yeah. Now you can tell that that's still important because we still prefix those. As long as they're still ebooks and audiobooks, for now. For, yes. So uh, that's what I mean. As long yeah. as they are, then we're still acknowledging that a book is, in essence, something physical with two covers and, and contents, as you said, and we need to make the difference marked. Mm. But who knows how long that's going to last? Mm-hmm. Sure. I, I suspect that, oh, I don't know, maybe in like a hundred years from now mm-hmm. that the, the word book might take on a meaning of like like composed content. Yeah, you know what I mean? Package. Like it, it, it yeah. will, exactly. Whether it's consumed auditorily, is that a word? <laughs> yeah. uh, orally, except when you don't write that down, it, it, it sounds like the wrong orally. Yes. So, <laughs> Hourly. Hourly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, auditorily, or if it's on a screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the No, that's definitely the, the direction of... it's going. It's already shorthanding that way. I'll talk about listening to a book. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I sometimes say, oh, what books are you reading? Well, I'm reading blah, 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 when actually I've been listening to it. Now, I still feel a discomfort with that, so I'll usually clarify. But in my head, reading a book and listening to an audiobook have merged pretty closely. Mm. It's also like the term acoustic guitar, which didn't exist until after the electric guitar. Right. A guitar was a guitar. That's mm-hmm. all there was. But it had to be qualified as an acoustic guitar to differentiate it from an electric guitar. So do you think we'll start saying a paper book more and more. A paper book, yeah. Or a or, And it's like telephones, book. too, like a landline phone. Mm-hmm. Nobody um, ever used to call them a landline because what on earth would they be other than that? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we can say that as soon as we start getting people saying physical book physical or paper book, book, book more and more, mm-hmm. then that means that book has now become disassociated with that as a basic meaning. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, very likely to happen. Just as a, uh, a quick anecdote about landline phones, mm-hmm. I was on the phone with a uh, younger relative of mine who's like 10 or 11. I was just saying hi. And I, I asked him to hold the line, you know, right. and he had no idea what I was talking about. And it kind of <laughs> kind of blew my mind. I was like, oh, of course, because you didn't grow up with house phones. The phone that you know is a cell phone and there's no line, line. to speak of. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, though, that it didn't it hasn't held on as a frozen, hmm. you know, like you talk about in the um, in the video. Dial. Mark, about yeah, dial. You still talk about I dialing. bet your cousin doesn't blanch at the word dial the phone, even though it, he may, he or she may have never actually seen a physical phone with a circular dial. And even that's not actually a dial. Mm hmm. Right, right. So that one's held on, but I guess the other one maybe just was never used as often. You know, it's just, it's a case by case kind of mm-hmm. thing. Like, I, I actually don't have an e reader or a Kindle, mm-hmm. but a- as you move from one page to the next, uh, uh, those are still called pages, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're called pages, and there's still chapters, and there's still the and they division. even have page turning animation that sort of replicates yeah. the look of turning a page. Not on all the time. I, mean, I think you can turn them, them off, but, but yeah, um, there's a lot of that sort of trying to keep the feel of the, mm-hmm. the book somehow. Mm. On the topic of books as technology, I mean, I think you're right. It is very easy to not think of, you know, that's one of the things we take for granted. In mm-hmm. fact, we take lots of types of technology for granted, language being the most fundamental that's relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, language is a technology. It's just one we obviously didn't have a word for before we had the language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, but... <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> but, yeah, that, so that, that's a technology that changed our vocabulary rather fundamentally, yes, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but um, books are a technology that is separate from the technology of writing. Indeed, yeah. So, I mean, it, writing existed as inscriptions on items, first of all, mm-hmm. um, and then soon they moved to the first sort of writing technology, the clay tablet in in Sumeria. Mm -hmm. And then it became a lot more compact in the scroll technology, Mm -hmm. a lot easier to store longer bits of information without a million little tablets. (laughs) But the, the invention of the of the codex book bound book was another big jump in in technological change because it allowed you to then look at sections of the book out of order. Mm -hmm. With a scroll, you have to literally scroll through it Mm -hmm. in order. But you can open a book to any section. And you can flip back easily. back easily. You can have two sections open and consult can, one against the yeah. other. Yeah, I think it. And since we've grown up with them, it's very easy to not realize how much of a difference it really genuinely makes to how mm-hmm. you can read, how you can compose, how you can study, research, learn, if you've got a book with pages as opposed to a scroll. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess I never really thought about that, that with an ebook, you can't really look at two separate two pages. portions yeah. of the book at the same time. Yeah. In a way, some elements of the ebook have actually turned uh, back the clock um, in terms of that technology. Now, you can, of course, flip from page to page. You know, you can mm-hmm. go section to section. You don't need to scroll back. Though it's a little clumsy, it is clumsy and it's hard because page numbers have become really complex on an e reader mm. because page numbers change depending. Like, if you change the font size, you change the page, you change the page, the pagination. Whoa, yeah, that makes sense. And you know, there's lots of reasons you might change the font size. That's one of the great values of an e reader is yeah. you can change the font size if you change the font. Now, not all e-readers let you do that, but if you change the font, it changes the pagination. If you change the justification, it changes the pagination. So there's no fixed pagination. So then the question, I think, for the publishers has become like, do we do we put an arbitrary pagination on that just stays there anyway? But that, of course, you can see immediately how the problems, you know, you don't want a page break in the middle of a page. page yeah. But right. it does mean that, say, you want to flip back to a page, to a that, page you've that you've already seen, seen. Yeah. Um, well, you have to sort of think, is it about a third of the way through? Okay, it's about... Now, that's true in a normal book, too, but it's actually a lot easier physically to hold your place, flip back, find the Mm -hmm. thing you wanted to do. And if you changed the font halfway through, you might have remembered, oh, that was on page 75. You know, now there's there's ways that they fixed that. They've got bookmarking functions. You can do bookmarks. You can do... Like, there's a bunch of stuff. I don't actually have a... I use a Kindle app on my iPad sometimes. I don't do a lot of e-reading, but I think other e-readers have even sort of more custom ways of doing this. The point here is not that it's bad or good. It's that it's changing the way you interact with the book because of certain physical constraints of the technology that will alter. On the other hand, you can highlight things and quote things and look words up on the fly and stuff like that. So there's lots of things that are great about it. Sure. But it's just, uh, it is changing our interaction with text yeah. because it's a new format. And that was true very much when they went from scroll to codex. Yeah, Yeah, I I mean, that's true of any technological innovation. Of course, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't looked this up. Was it Plato that was very much against Mm -hmm. writing things down because it would ruin the purity or the... It ruined memory, specifically, among other things. Yeah. Yeah, we actually talked about that a long time ago on this podcast, way back near the beginning. One of our first episodes. One of our first episodes. And um, yeah, Plato reports Socrates as disliking writing. There's a whole dialogue where a large portion of it is concerned with how you shouldn't write down wisdom. You should learn it from a person and then you should memorize it and remember it. And that to do otherwise is as a changes the way you interact with the wisdom and also makes you lose your memory. And of course he was right. Writing things down did Does affect our memory. Our memory. Yeah. You know, as a as a culture, we're much, much worse at remembering things than we were pre literacy. Sure. The question is, is that a worse loss than the gain that yeah. we've had by being able to transmit knowledge from one person to another without the medium of face to face contact? And, and from generation to generation. Generation to generation. And to have have libraries that hold more knowledge than any human can hold. I mean, personally, I'm okay with that trade-off. Oh, yeah. I, I'm on team writing. Writing's yeah. awesome. <laughs> but it's a trade-off. And, and so to recognize that is to recognize mm-hmm. that every technology we invent gives us trade-offs. And it's the same with electronic mm-hmm. transmission, the Google effect of mm-hmm. not re- remembering stuff as well because mm-hmm. you can search it. Mm-hmm. And yes, that's a loss, but is it also a gain? So, yeah. you know, that and sometimes sometimes the losses may outweigh the gains. Mm-hmm. I'm not always pro-technology. But to say that if technology is changing us is not a criticism. Mm-hmm. It's just a fact of life. <laughs> yeah. And, and it always has. It, and it's, it's kind of a metaphor for language change itself as well. Like language has been changing since day one and will continue to change. But of course, in, in different ways. Now, you know, before there was the mass media and standardized education, mm-hmm. you, your neighbors that live 20 miles away uh, might have completely different words for some very basic things and a different accent. But now that doesn't really happen. So I think today the main source of language change might be technology itself. I I, I haven't really thought about that too hard. I just thought of that on the moment mm-hmm. on the spot now well certainly it's a very big driver of it i would say mm-hmm. and probably yeah. more and since technology is changing so much faster than it did 100 years ago or 500 yeah. years ago it's going to be a faster driver of change than it used to be because there's just more technological change mm-hmm. yeah yeah sure the other major element that probably hasn't been lost and won't be anytime soon is the um, sort of sociological effect of generational change like new generations always want to have slang terms that are different from their parents slang terms yeah. and then there and that's 
you know, even if, as you say, the regionalisms are less of a factor, the generational change, and we still see that because as far as linguists, as far as I know, still say that, you know, young girls are still the drivers of of semantic change Mm -hmm. and of vocabulary Mm -hmm. change and of other grammatical change because of this generational effect. So I think that probably Mm -hmm. hasn't changed too much, but you're right. Technology has got to be a much bigger driving force than it used to be. Yeah. I don't know that much about the history of slang or uh, mm-hmm. I, I haven't researched it explicitly. It's, it's on my long list of things to, <laughs> right, to dive into. Maybe uh, yeah. in like the next, <laughs> it's like four or five months from now, that'll be my slang project, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll get to it soon. We could, we, could talk, we could talk again later. The thing about slang is, is, and I'm not no expert on it. I mean, I'm always the non-expert in the room on these, <laughs> on these things, but is that my understanding too, is that slang changes as slang, sure, yeah. but also slang becomes non-slang, not all of it. But, but can can yeah. mm-hmm. and so you know changes in in what is being used as slang can drive changes in more mainstream language yeah. too. Like okay is you know one of these yeah. weird fads of the nineteenth century to turn things into initialisms. initialisms, and also a weird fad to misspell things intentionally for mm-hmm. humorous effect, and so all correct gets abbreviated as okay. Mm-hmm, when it doesn't make any sense at all. Sense, and yet that it, one has become... And it's become this hugely successful word that's spread all over the world, even outside of English. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, And while, yes, it's still slang, I mean, we all would think of it as informal, it's core vocabulary. Yeah. The one big exception, of course, is cool, which has survived generations. Yeah, yeah. It's the one unusual slang word that hasn't gone out of fashion. Mm. Mm-hmm. What is cool, cool. changes. Yes, <laughs> right, exactly. Cool, yeah. What is cool changes every five seconds, as far as I can tell now. I don't know how much, there's so much more on the technology of the book and how it changes, but I don't know if we want to get into all the details of it. I mean, there's so much about actual book construction and yeah. things, and I know you have friends, Mark, who teach history of the book classes. Yes, um, I have actual codicology expert friends who <laughs> do that as a living who do that as a living yeah. which is pretty cool and i have friends who bind their own books and such because yeah. i have artist friends who do that one of the things i think that is also important is how the technology changes impact very much um the availability of books and that is one of the things too not just the availability of the text within the book that how how easy it is to read but what you kind of outlined but didn't get into in the video as much is the expense and the difficulty of yes. bookmaking and how that has changed, and of course, the printing press and things like that, massively changed the availability of books and who was able to read them. And that, of course, has had a massive effect on language change, too, mm-hmm. because one of the things that literacy does is it doesn't entirely slow down or stop <laughs> by any means language change, mm-hmm. but it does affect it. It does. And yeah, actually, if you if you look at the sort of historical period, you know, the, in the first 50 years of the printing press in Europe... Mm-hmm. More books were published than than were more books were produced than the previous one thousand years, mm-hmm. and a lot of those by a small handful of printers mm-hmm. who then have a disproportionate effect on language change because they establish which words and which spellings are standard. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And so that's one way. Also, the mere fact that language is standardized. So before, yeah. when writing and books are the purview of a very small minority who mm-hmm. are literate, there is no standardization. Yeah. There's no mechanism for standardization. I mean, yes, there's standard dialects and all the rest of it, and you want to sound like the people at court, but you can't transmit that very far. It doesn't overcome regionalisms. Mm-hmm. It, it can't be halted in the generational chains and things like that. So the obvious place that you see that is in written Latin versus spoken Latin. Right. Right. Mm. The immense frozen nature of written Latin, where we have the Latin from pre end of the Republic. So let's say first century BC from there to well, in some some ways now. Yeah. But certainly until the Renaissance, Mm -hmm. until well, forever, really, written Latin has Has not not changed. changed, No. I mean, yes, there were some changes in medieval Latin. There's some simplifications of grammar and a couple of other changes and an introduction of new vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But essentially, it was a frozen language. And, you know, somebody who could read a 15th century Renaissance Latin text could could also read read Cicero Cicero. or whatever. Right, Right. And 
and and with almost no trouble. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and Cicero could have even more startlingly. I think yeah. Cicero could have been presented with a 15th century Renaissance Latin text. And yeah, other no, than not knowing some of the words, vocabulary, but you know, the language, the, the grammar changes that happened were all in the in towards simplification and using things that already existed, essentially. Yeah. I don't think he would have been phased in the slightest. And that's, you know, in a sense, bizarre. Yeah, yeah it's very, very strange and thought provoking. Yeah. And it's because it was preserved in writing. Mm -hmm. And the counter case is what happened to spoken language. Because even by the first century CE, so, you know, 200 years after the time or 100 years after the time of Cicero, we already have evidence from, you know, the very, very tiny scraps of writing that we have that spoken language around all of Italy and throughout the provinces had diverged we have and we have people talking about how different the accents are we can see already that there's a massive change and i know that we can use the principles of ling linguistics to trace the various romances languages back to mm -hmm. see that already clearly changes in terms of which vocabulary has entered the language and what grammatical forms and what stage it's at in terms of dropping the endings and changing and simplifying the case system and all of that is happening at a different rate in the different provinces. So already by the second century, probably the roots of each of those different spoken languages we've got. And yet you couldn't see a single trace of that in the writing. Right. Well, I mean, I that might be, or that is a product of having a standardized written education in the absence mm -hmm. of the technology of mass media the, so everyone can hear each other. Uh, right. And communication, right. just to tie it back to technology. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. So yes, yeah, so they're all reading the same handful of texts. The uniformity of educational systems and practices was really, really important for this. Yeah. It's not just that things are written, it's that they were all, you know, even in the 15th century, they are all still reading their Cicero and their Virgil. Exactly. So yeah, that's yeah. absolutely key. But also, so you get that divergence of the of the spoken, spoken and the written. And the written. Yeah. But I think what's interesting is once you have the new technological change of the printing press and paper, and those two things go on hand in hand, the printing press wouldn't have been much use if you still had to print on parchment. Yes. Because it still would have been so massively expensive, even yeah. with the movable type. Right. So that was the other big technological development is yeah. making linen paper and yeah. so forth. Yeah. So once you have paper and you have a movable type, then you have the situation where you are standardizing the language through writing, like the Latin. But at the same time, it's also widespread. So now, I, you know, I don't know, and I know there are linguists who must have studied this. To what extent did that slow or alter or just affect the rate of spoken language change? You know, has spoken language changed less quickly since widespread literacy? And Ah, yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. You, you, you see what I mean? Like, unlike the divergence with Latin, what you had is such a small number of people using write, written right. Latin that even as they changed the way they spoke, they still kept to this very standard writing. So does the level of literacy, is the level of literacy tied inversely to the change do i have that right <laughs> yeah, i don't know I'm, I'm not sure i can i can write it as a as an equation but basically you know since shakespeare's time yeah have we as speakers of english changed our language less than we would have had we not all been literate mm. and the reason i say that is because you know things like the 19th 18th and 19th century insistence on grammatical rules however mm -hmm. pig-headed wrong and latinate they were and they were all of those things. Yeah. But it means that, you know, people are trying to, when we speak formal English, we're trying to speak like the books we read. Hmm. Surely that's got to have been a bit of a drag on the language change process. Don't you think? Yes, but probably not as much as you might think. Just because of the fact that the amount of language that's spoken drastically dwarfs the amount of language written. Yeah, mm. but the sociological effects of caring more about the written stuff, does that, you don't think that? Um, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure, as I said, I'm sure this is a studied thing. And yeah. There probably is literature. It would be this. interesting to see if, if the rate of language change is completely consistent or is there a mm. slowing down of that mm -hmm. uh, i uh, gosh i mean there are so many factors uh, to, to mm -hmm. take into consideration yeah. i mean yeah no it's, it might be impossible to... <laughs> yeah if you were to go back fifteen thousand years ago mm -hmm. the sem semantic change might be happening less quickly just because there are less new things entering mm -hmm. into people's everyday lives but yeah pr pronunciation certainly was changing 
well, I, I don't know if, if I would say quickly, but th- th- those forces were definitely underway, whereas pronunciation also was changing in English and perhaps mm-hmm. even still is under the under our conscious awareness. Yeah, because, I mean, one of the things that writing doesn't, <laughs> writing in English anyway, has not helped slow is pronunciation change. Right, no. right. Because we've just divorced our mm-hmm. spoken language from the representation of yeah. it in writing and yeah. been like, I don't care what those letters mm-hmm. say they should sound like. We're just going to say things anyway. Mm-hmm. And we see that most obviously in the fact that writing did not stop the Great Vowel Shift. Yeah. So, I mean, had there been, if, if that had hel- yeah. if that had actually been enough to prevent people from changing mm-hmm. the way they spoke, then we'd still be able to spell phonetically and we can't. Well, and right. consider what a short period of time separates the divergence of British and American yeah. English. And how very different the accent. And, and yet there's, yeah, yeah there's yeah. so different. Yeah. So regionalism still is back. And as you say, years. Ray, I mean, yeah, there's, it's probably an impossible thing to tease apart because at the same point as I'm saying, well, maybe what language change was semantic change was was and grammatical i'm thinking actually as much of of grammatical change as semantic change changes in you know basic grammar and things like that might have been more frozen Mm. because of the development of rules and because we decided to teach everyone grammatical rules in a very widespread way from a written text right like they were doing in latin but now we're also you know wrapping people over the knuckles if they speak the wrong way Mm. But presumably they were doing that at Rome too. So I don't really know. But at the same time as they're doing as that, of course, they're also building colonial empires and meeting massive new numbers of influx of new languages and developing massive new technologies. So yeah, I mean, those are all going to affect change massively. So probably it's impossible to unpick the different mechanisms and see if there's mm. a, a rate change. Mm-hmm. So anyway, but I do think it's interesting that you know, one way or another, it's going to have affected it. Yeah. So since we're kind of coming up to the end of the podcast, I will close off just to see, Ray, do you have any sort of favorites? I know that you've already done a number of words and I mean, I've enjoyed all of them. I I liked tea particularly because I like tea particularly. (laughs) (laughs) That was a good one. But are there... Are there favorite sort of mechanisms or types of semantic change that you like? Because one of the things we haven't really touched on, but that's fine because it was mm-hmm. covered in the in the video, was the particular mechanisms by which words change, the amelioration and pejoration, mm-hmm. the widening and narrowing, narrowing and, and you know, all of those things. Is there any mechanism that particularly amuses you or an example of one that you can call to mind? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I particularly have a favorite mechanism because, you know, each word or the story of each word's evolution is just so different. So even if you can classify mm-hmm. it as amelioration or pejoration, the means traveled by each individual word to attain that end that we then, you know, retroactively mm-hmm. categorize it as right. it's it's hard to say that I have a favorite mechanism by which the change occurs. But the the word sinister is uh, very interesting ah, to yes. me just because it's so it's so complicated so uh, just to give uh, listeners who might not know the story of sinister is that uh, originally it referred to the left and it it was an, a term used in augury which is the uh, roman ritual by which omens are determined by observing birds It originally referred to an unlucky superstition affiliated with the left, but as kind of superstitions began to fade and the world became a little more secular, it seemed kind of ridiculous to call your left hand sinister while (laughs) its uh, its evil connotations were, you know, becoming more predominant. Yeah, and and if people want to hear all the ins and outs of that, they should, of course, go listen to your particular episode on Sinister, in which you go through it in in great detail. And it is, that is a really fascinating one, because it it ties so clearly. I mean, you talk about the cultural connotations of left in other languages, too, and the way it works in different Romance languages. And I thought that was really interesting, because that I hadn't really thought about the different connotations, you know, that gauche has, as opposed to sinister or and i didn't know spanish because i don't know spanish at all so yeah that i i agree that's a a really good one i also enjoyed the meat episode that you did oh well well thank you Uh, and how meat that even just as small a difference as the king james bible to now which i suppose is a fairly long time but as a classicist it seems very recent that such a short period of time would make such a drastic difference to what it meant 
to such a level that actual theological implications of whether vegetarianism or not, for instance, was at stake. I thought that was really interesting. Oh, at stake. At, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you beat me to it. <laughs> I only realized just as it came out. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the King James Bible is just so weird to me because it, it's strange that it's still read and like widely regarded as you know one of the foremost translations of the Bible just because what other text that is from the 17th century that do we still read today? And mm. think we understand. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but there, there are a lot of things that we don't understand or we think we understand. You know, I, mm -hmm. you really have to go through the King James Bible with a, with a really critical eye. And uh, mm -hmm. because language changes, if we're going to take this, this text at face value as, you know, the quote unquote word of God, you need to really get in there with your microscope and your cultural analytical lens, lenses. You know, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You have to be a detective. You absolutely need to realize that it is a frozen moment of translation and quite apart from the problem that it's translating from multiple other languages, which yeah. is an issue, but that also we have to translate it into we and everybody knows that with Shakespeare. They know they don't understand Shakespeare. In fact, lots of people think they don't understand it more than they don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, yeah. Shakespeare is more understandable than many people think yeah. it is. Yeah. But the Bible is less understandable than many people think that it is. And part of that's to do with the fact that we get so many quotes and turns of phrase from the Bible that it sounds familiar, yeah. even if we don't actually understand what those turns of phrase mean. Sure. I think the presence of the, like, the and thine in the mm -hmm. King James Bible, uh, I mean, is a great example of that. There's, there's no reason that anyone in 2017 should understand the and thine, but I think specifically because of the King James Bible and how mm. like many of those quotes are just ingrained into our culture, whether you're a Christian or not, we know the archaic thee and thine and thou cases. But what they don't understand is the cultural implications of the use of them. That's right. Right. And I, I right. can't remember if you, you mentioned this in podcast, certainly it's a truism, but the fact that when God is addressed as thee and thou, it's not a mark of formality. It's a mark of intimacy. Intimacy, yeah. Right. The, quite and the opposite. And we flipped that completely around mm -hmm. because we don't understand it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So again, that's an example of thinking we understand the Bible in the King James Version. Ah, you know what? Maybe to answer your question, do I have a favorite mechanism of language change? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily just semantic change, but language change overall. I would say maybe misunderstanding. Because uh, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. it, it's the most naive and genuine of them all. And can lead to some really fun changes because it can lead into larger leaps, I think. You know, some of the other changes, they have to kind of go by gradual steps. Right. Because that's right. the process. Whereas reanalysis of a word or a misunderstanding of a word can flip it almost in meaning. And I can't, of course, think of any example off the top of my head. <laughs> but I can think of how a form of a word has changed through misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Sneeze used to be fneeze with an F. But the long S? But the long S got misread. Okay, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Oh, I, I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, it used to be sneeze, and it is now sneeze. And, I, you know, when I first heard that explanation, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, that, that can't be true. But all the sources seem to support this. So, so there, was, there was a word sneeze, and there was no word sneeze, and then, and then yeah, at some point... It became sneeze. Somebody saw an F and thought it must be a long S. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, the F-N combination is not a natural no. English combination, so I right, can see that. Right. <laughs> All right. I'm willing to call that my new favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we should probably leave it here. I'm sure we could wander down the paths of yeah, fun etymologies of forever. We could go on, but... but since we, we all have our own platforms for continuing that mm -hmm. fun discussion. <laughs> this is true. We can stop now. But thank you so much for coming on, Ray. It's been really fun to chat Indeed, with you. Yeah. Oh, with you guys, too. Thanks for having me. And why don't you remind everybody how to find you in the various places you might want to be found? Oh, sure. Well, just one more time, the name of the podcast is Words for Granted. And you, you could find it on any of the uh, podcasting platforms. You find it on iTunes, on Stitcher, Google mm -hmm. Play, Lipson. If there's a podcast player, you're on it. Yeah, pretty much. I'm not on SoundCloud, but pretty much all the right. others, you can find me there. And you've got a website, it's wordsforgranted.com. Oh, that one's important. Uh, thank you. Wordsforgranted.com. <laughs> 
And uh, should any of you have any questions for me, you can reach me at wordsforgranted at gmail.com. And you're on Twitter as... Words for Granted. And Facebook as Words for Granted as well. You're strong with the branding. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't done nearly as good a job as be, at being the same everywhere, yeah. but <laughs> well done. Yeah, it, it actually it has confused me on multiple occasions searching for you. Right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we came at it all slightly piecemeal, and so we didn't end up with the same names everywhere. But there you go. Well, we will look forward to the next word biography. That's how I think of them. I, I like them as, as oh, biographies I like that too. of words. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll keep chatting online. Yeah, indeed. Will do. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you guys. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>